Struggling with life in the real world? You're going to love our latest home speaker device. Hey, Dad, what kind of pliers should I use on this? Uh, you should be using a wrench. Oh, do I have a wrench? You have three. Ah, thanks, Dad. Introducing the Dad Personal Assistant, our newest smart speaker with all the character and compassion of a father. Up and at him, it's a beautiful day. Dad, it's Saturday. Yeah, it's a great day to get outside. It's 6 a.m. Well, then you better get moving before it gets any later. Designed with advanced features, the Dad PA connects to all your other smart home devices. Dad, please set the thermostat to 70 degrees. No problem. Setting the thermostat to 68 degrees. Um, no, let's keep it at 70 degrees. Sure thing. Thanks, Dad. We're going to save so much money. He syncs with your calendar to help you stay on track. Looks like you're overdue for an oil change. Oh, hey, you're right. Can you schedule one for Friday? I've already got it scheduled. Just don't miss it, okay? <laughs> okay, I won't. <laughs> Seriously, don't miss it. The Dad PA is always watching out for you. Lights on. Uh, hey, it's getting late. I think it's about time for Brad to head home. <sighs> Dad. The Dad Personal Assistant includes a wealth of knowledge and opinions on a wide variety of subjects. Dad, can you help me with my taxes? Dad, do you know a good mechanic? Hey, Dad, can you tell me a joke? Sure. The joke is one billion dollars. Yeah, I don't get it. That's right. And you never will. Ah, nice one. <laughs> oh, I'm hilarious. Based on God's original design, the Dad Personal Assistant is wise, caring, faithful, and devoted. Don't worry. You've got this. You are the strongest person I know. You have made me so proud. You are God's child, and you don't need anyone else to complete you, especially not Brad. <sighs> really, Dad? I'm just saying, there's other fish in the sea. Okay, wow. The Dad Personal Assistant. Always thoughtful, always dependable, and always there for you. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Happy Father's Day to all the dads that are out there. Special day. Hopefully kids, be nice to dad today. All right? Dad needs to be re relaxing, eating his favorite food. No problems today. And all the dads said, amen. All right. And that includes my kids, even though they're grown. Be nice to dad today. But uh, it's great to have everybody here today. Well, let's go ahead and stand. We'll begin our service. Uh, by singing blessed be your name a great song for us to start off today let the song once again starts here inside of you but let it come out in your expression feel that once again god is speaking to you and preparing our hearts for the message of the word of god let's sing together
Amen. It's great to be here with everybody. And as we sing our next song, Redeem Though I Love to Proclaim It, we can rejoice in the fact that Christ has saved us from eternal damnation. That's something we should smile about and praise the Lord for. singing like you mean it this morning. Praise the Lord. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, take two offerings today, uh, just because you give so much and then one offering, it just overflows, so we need to take two. <laughs> no, that's not really the case. Uh, we've been mentioning this basically as a church. Uh, we do, being where we're situated in things and with people we try to help here in our community, we have from time to time folks in our church family that we take a love offering for and try to help with them along the way. In the last couple of weeks, we've had some kind of more desperate situations that have come up, and uh, so the church has helped out, but we'd like to help out a little bit more. Um, we don't have this necessarily fixed into our church budget, and what we do is basically as people donate, we, we do this together. And so we're going to take just a special love offering. This is not our general fund offering that we normally take where you give your, your tithes and your offerings and uh, your missions. Uh, this is primarily, once again, just to be a blessing to others. And those who got my text yesterday uh, or phone call, uh, give like you would want somebody to give if it was your situation. Sometimes we forget that. We think, well, I'll just give them you know, five bucks. Well, wait a minute. If you were in this situation and you had a family, what would you want somebody else to do for you? And truthfully, that's how we ought to respond. So let me encourage you just to think about that. And once again, fellas, go ahead and come forward. We're going to take a, the offering here after the word of prayer, and uh, I'll let you be seated at that point. Uh, but uh, as we're singing the song, they'll be taking the offering. Hopefully it will be a blessing to those that we're able to be an encouragement to. Uh, we do want to, as we go to the Lord in prayer today, remember a number of folks. I talked to uh, Kathy Kritzinger yesterday. Uh, of course, she had a stroke a few months back. She's slowly getting many of her, much of her motor skills back, but there's still some things that uh, she's not able to do. She has difficulty walking and moving and things, as you can imagine. So if we can keep them in prayer, I know they would appreciate that. And uh, it seems right now, from what I understand, most everybody in the church is healthy. All God's people said, Amen. Hey, man, that's a great thing, isn't it? And uh, so praise the Lord once again that uh, the Lord is blessed and answered our prayers in that regard. Let's pray for our nation. Our nation needs prayer. Amen. You know, I was, I was seeing the other day that people are even attacking the idea of Father's Day, that somehow it's not inclusive enough. It's, not, it's like, well, I think it's supposed to be a day to honor fathers. I think that's what it's supposed to be. Uh, but our nation has kind of gotten off track with so many things with all this woke nonsense that's going around. Uh, but uh, let's pray for our nation. I believe that once again, be, that God holds the heart of kings in his hand. It's our king's heart in his hands and turn them whithersoever he will. God can go ahead and direct these things. And our nation needs revival. Amen. Our nation needs to come back to the Lord. So let me encourage us just to simply keep that as a matter of prayer as well. Pray for our president. Pray for our troops, especially. Lord, we keep them in, their, in his special care. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll bless the offering as well at the time. And we'll continue with our service. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this chance that we have, Lord, to meet together. Lord, what a great nation this is that we are able to, Lord, have 
the opportunity, Lord, to meet and share our faith with one another openly. Lord, there are those in other parts of the world that would give anything to be able to do just that. Lord, we have the word of God in our own language. Lord, we're able to sing praises to your name. Lord, may you help us, Lord, to be mindful, Lord, of the freedoms that we have, but also that we would be, Lord, allowing your Holy Spirit to move in our hearts today. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the, the health that you've given our church at this time. Continue to watch over Paul and Kathy. Lord, may you bring Kathy back to better health soon so we can enjoy her fellowship as well. Lord, be with those of our church family that I know today are traveling. Keep them safe. Watch over them. And Father, I do pray, Lord, that you would just help each and every one of us, Lord, to, Lord, be mindful, uh, Lord, of the fact that, that we owe everything to you, Lord. You are, you are so good to us. So, Father, as we meet today and we sing songs, may we enjoy the singing, but may it prepare our hearts for the message of the Word of God. Watch over us now. Be with the offering as well. May it be given freely. Lord, may we uh, give from our hearts. Lord, that everything that we're doing now, Lord, in giving this offering, Lord, would encourage those that need it most. Thank you for the opportunity we have to give. And Lord, I do pray that you'd watch over, Lord, those that are struggling, Lord, that need it most. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this wonderful crowd that is here today. Lord, may you honor us, and Lord, by your presence moving among us. In thy precious son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And we'll have the offering. Go ahead and begin passing the plate as they do. Let's go ahead and sing our next song. It is well, it is well with my soul. final song, Oh Praise the Name.
to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. check your salvation amen you may be seated and uh usually we dismiss the kids we're gonna wait here just for a second because i got some dad jokes for the kids what would be a father's day without dad jokes i love dad jokes okay so kids go ahead and stay in here just for a second then we'll dismiss everybody all right but uh you hopefully you can write some of these down tell them to your friends later they're fantastic jokes just want you to know that all right here we go did you hear of the local guy who took an airline company to court after his luggage went missing? He lost his case. <laughs> All right. A Spanish magician told everyone he would disappear. He said uno, dos, and then left without a trace. <laughs> a police officer came to my house and asked where I was between five and six. He seemed irritated when I answered kindergarten. 
What did one ocean say to the other ocean? Nothing. They just waved. It's a dad joke. I didn't say that. How do basketball players stay cool during the game? They stand next to their fans. All right. What do you call a fat psychic? A fortune teller. <laughs> That's good. I don't care who you are. That's funny. How does a penguin build its house? He glues it together. He glues, glues, glues. Although Karl Marx is more famous, his sister Anya is often mentioned at track meets. Anya Marx? <laughs> this, this, hang on a second. Don't go to the, this is my all-time favorite. I laughed myself silly when I saw this one. Where do you find a dog with no legs? Right where you left him. <laughs> a little dark humor for you today. All right, kids, you may just be dismissed to go to children's church. I love dad jokes. And I do. I love dad jokes. Dad jokes are funny. <laughs> yeah, you say, oh, that's so ridiculous. You'll be using those. You will. All right, we're going to continue with our series we've been looking at, and we talked about church membership. And as I said uh, a couple weeks ago, we're using the term membership. Obviously, we want you to join the church if this is where God calls you to be. Our church isn't for everybody, but church membership, when we use the term membership, really what I'm talking about is church functioning, church uh, working in a church. You don't have to be a member at our church to do a lot of different things that are here in our church. You can just be a regular attendee and come and get involved as you want to be. Uh, we have folks that are members of our church that and they help do everything from help fix up the building to uh, help stuff tracks to do all sorts of different things to do. Help with ushering. We always need help with that. Um, nursery, children's ministries. You just can't be a teacher or a pastor or a deacon unless you want to be, a, unless you're a member of the church. That's kind of the, the primary thing. And if you're not a member, then you don't get a chance to vote on the direction that the church goes when we have uh, business meetings. Other than that, there's a lot of opportunities for you to be able to serve with. And we talked about here, uh, the very first week we did this, I will be a functioning church member. God has saved you to serve, not to sit. Okay? We ought to be active in our, in our church attendance. Number two, we talked about this last week, uh, we ought to be a, a unifying church member. We ought to be those that endeavor to bring about the bond of peace. We ought not to cause dissension. We ought to try to bring people together. And so today we're going to talk about, I will not let my church be about my preferences and desires. Okay, I will not let my church be about my preferences and desires. I believe there's a video here. Why don't you go ahead and show the video? None of the other guys work for their loans. I thought we had this all thrashed out before. We did. Well, why bring it up again? Cause. Cause why? Just cause. Son, that causing can go on and on if you give it its head. Now, what's this all about? I just don't want to work for my allowance. Opie, I'm very busy right now. Like I say, we've been through all that before. I still don't want to work for my allowance. Fine. You don't have to. Oh, boy! No work, no allowance. That's not fair! Don't raise your voice to me. Now, you get on out of here. I got things to do. What are you doing? <laughs> Opie, I asked you what you're doing. I was holding my breath. Good. Good lung exercise. <laughs> Opie, what are you doing now? I'm crying and I can't stop. Oh, shame. <laughs> Get your clothes all dirty. (laughs) (laughs) 
we laugh at that and think, how silly, right? You see, you ever see that kid in the grocery store that's screaming and hollering? And the parent's oblivious. They're just like totally ignoring it. And I'm like, everybody else sees it. You probably ought to deal with that. Uh, but we laugh about that because we think to ourselves, how childish, right? It's not how life works. What do you tell your kids when they say, Dad, that's not fair? Life's not fair, right? How many kids have heard that? How many teens have ever heard their parents say that? Yeah, life's not fair. Uh, and that's a true statement. Life is not fair. But you know what? Can I, can I share something with us today? And I, I, I want to be honest and preach with you and not at you today, if you know the difference there. I, I, we're all susceptible to this. If we're not careful, we let our church attendance and our happiness at church and even our choice of what church we go to be based not on doctrine, not on evangelism, not on the preaching of the Word of God and the moving of the Holy Spirit, but we base it upon our preferences and what we like instead of what we need. You say, what's the difference? I've seen church members act like that. I have. They say they actually fall on the ground. No, that, I'd get video of that. That would be funny. No, but what they do is they just get ornery. They start writing letters. They start talking to people. They start complaining. And once again, not about Pastor Crawford no longer believes in the, the doctrine of the, of the blood atonement. No, that, that doesn't happen. And then when they're confronted about it or they're talked to about it, they get upset. Even to the point of saying, I'm not going back. Once again, not because there's any doctrinal difference or any directional difference. It's all the peripheral preferences that we have keep us from truly enjoying what, why God brings us together. We've got to be careful about that. You say, kids can be selfish and demanding. They can be. But adults, if we're not careful, we can be selfish and demanding as well. Um, in 32 years of pastoring, 30 years of pastoring, rather, I've seen things happen in churches that just baffle me. I've seen people leave over parking spaces. I've seen people leave over a handshake or a lack of it. I've seen people leave literally over somebody sat in my pew. Now, those are things we think, oh, that's just a sermon illustration. I've watched it happen. Somebody said something mean to me. Somebody didn't treat me right or somebody didn't treat my child right, so I'm going to leave. And I think to myself, you're letting the outside, the peripheral things dictate your direction and what God is trying to do in your life. We've got to be careful. Our text this morning is going to be found in Mark chapter 9. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. We do have them up here on the screen as well. If you've got a bulletin, you can flip that over, and it has a worksheet. Of basically, you can fill it in as we go. I, I encourage you to bring your Bible and to write these things down. Because I want you to go home and study them for yourself. I want you to go home and, and do a little more in-depth Bible study on yourself and see, well, Lord, is this something that I should work on or something I should change? Jesus here is speaking. He says, and he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, notice this here, if any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Let's go ahead and say this verse together here. Mark nine thirty five, And he sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, if any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Can I ask you this one rhetorical question? That means don't give me an answer out loud. That's what rhetorical means. Rhetorical question. Can you say that that's how you're living your Christian life? How much happier our marriages would be, our families would be, our other friendship relationships would be and how much happier our churches would be if we just simply do what jesus is commanding in one verse i'm going to be last of all now why generally don't we want to be last okay we had a picnic last week what happens when you're last food's cold not much your, your choices are limited there's no more ketchup that happened last week. I was, my daughter, I'm so proud. That's, that's exactly what I was thinking, too. Huh? You got to park farther back? Huh? You, can't, you pick up the scraps of what's left behind. 
So that's why we want to be in line first, right? What does Scripture tell us to do here? It says we need to make sure that we are last of all. That's how we view ourselves. And that other people get their way before I do. And on top of that, not just that mentality, but I'm going to be their servant. I'm going to serve those people that are first in line that I have put in a place above myself. Now, just think in your family, in your family dynamic, wouldn't that be great if your children acted like that, parents? Huh? Now, my kids always did. <laughs> we never had a problem with that. <laughs> yeah, right. Huh? How much happier you'd be, dads, moms, if you served your children? Huh? Oh, we, we, we think, well, that's not why they're there. God gave me children so I don't have to walk anymore. <laughs> but what example do we set to our children when we serve them? When we put them first? We're teaching them an example, a Christian principle that they need to have in their life. And maybe once again, if we would do that, what will we get in return? You reap what you sow. If I put them first, if I put my wife first, they will put me first. Back when cartoons were funny, remember the two chipmunks who used to be so generous to each other? How many of you remember that? What I'm talking about, oh, no, you go first. No, please, you, you go first. No, I don't want to go. You go before I do. No, I don't. They're going back and forth. They're so polite that nothing ever really gets done. But you know what? What would our lives be like if we just began to serve each other? And we determined I'm not going to have to be first in line. My opinion doesn't have to be the one that's taken. What I desire really doesn't matter as much as the collective whole. And because of that, I want to go ahead and put Jesus Christ first and live by his example. Let's go ahead and look at this. Three points here this morning. Number one, the servant motif. The servant motif. The word servant occurs 57 times in the New Testament. And the word serve, this is kind of extra here, the word serve, just simply serve, is used 58 times. Do you realize how many that is? 115. Huh? 115 times he uses the word servant or serve. So how much do you think Jesus felt it was important? Did the Lord feel it was important that we understand that this is the attitude that we ought to exude? Stop and think to yourself here. Let her, let her be here in the next part here. Jesus said we must be servant of all in this passage. Verse number 35, again, what is it he said? Shall be last of all and servant of all. Did Jesus ever do anything for himself? Stop and think about it. Did Jesus ever do anything for himself? In fact, wasn't he tempted to do some things for himself? Remember when Jesus was tempted in the, in the wilderness? Forty days he had fasted. The devil comes to him and says, smell that fresh bread. huh? Boy, command these stones, they be made into bread. What was the devil tempting him to do? To use his power for himself. To gratify his own things. Now, there's nothing wrong with eating bread. In fact, I have a love affair with bread. I, I love bread. But fresh bread right out of the oven, you know what I'm talking about? Man, get that butter and just smear it on top of it. It melts into it. Let's have a word of prayer and go eat. <laughs> Do you know the word shall is a really important word? Some, some other versions change that to will and other things. Uh, the word shall is really important. Anybody ever remember where there's another passage that has a lot of shalls in it? Ten Commandments. Does that mean they're optional? Huh? If you feel like it? No. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt. That word shall is really, it's, it's important. It's a command that's being used. Do we realize that Jesus Christ is here isn't just giving us an optional way to live the Christian life. He says, if you desire to be put first, the same shall be. Shall be. Makes it a practice because of the command of God that they be a servant to all. Not just Jesus, but also the Apostle Paul said this. Paul said we must be servants as well. 
1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 19. Paul says this, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself, what? Servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Do you want to see more people accept Jesus Christ as their Savior? Do you want to see more people accept Jesus Christ as their Savior? Do you want to see more people have their life transformed by the Holy Spirit of God? Do you want to see more families put back together, more marriages put back together? Do you want to see God's hand work mightily in the lives of others? That's why we're here, isn't it? To equip the saints, to go out and reach a lost world. Paul says, because I want to see more people saved, because I want to gain the more, because I want more people to come to church, I have made it a practice of myself that I have made myself servant unto all. That does not come naturally. You ever watch two-year-olds in the nursery? All right, Aria, that's my granddaughter. Sweetest, smartest, most beautiful grandchild ever. I'm just making that as a statement that she's ever. Until Kira came along. <laughs> I don't pull Aria aside and say, okay, you're going to go in the nursery. Here's a game plan, Aria. See that little snotty-nosed kid over there? When they go to grab a toy, you just say, mine, and run over and grab it for yourself. That's the game plan. And if they go to grab a different toy, drop that one and go get that one and say, mine, until you have all the toys for yourself. Did I have to teach her that? She does it naturally. Huh? Their arms are full of toys. The one little kid has a box, a cardboard box. Ah! Huh? I got to have that. It's our nature to want to be first. It's our nature to want to have everything for ourselves. That is our human nature. And that is what we need to die daily to and live unto Christ. We need to put to death that old nature, that old man that desires selfishness and carnality and live unto Christ so that the world can see that something has changed about us. This is what Paul is saying. He says, I've made myself. I've forced myself. I have made it a command to myself that I become a servant to all. No matter what their station, no matter who they are, I am their servant first. Because I want to see them saved. You ever look at that verse and realize that's what he's saying? I'll be honest with you. I read this a couple weeks ago and it all of a sudden just began to just well in my head. And I'm thinking, my goodness. If our churches would begin to serve people, if we as individual members would go out into our communities and begin to be the servant unto everyone, they would definitely see a difference. And we definitely would have less problems in our churches. Number two, they did a survey, and this is kind of just more of a point, I guess, to make. But when we, the, the author of this uh, book, uh, I Am a Church Member, he did a survey and in the survey, he did a number of different things about the dominant characteristics of churches that are inwardly focused. You say, what is he saying? He's talking about those churches that are all about their preferences. When churches become center-focused, when they're no longer focused on reaching the lost, they're not concerned with evangelism, they're only so focused upon themselves. He said these are some of the things, the, the primary things that they begin to focus on. Number one, worship wars. Worship wars. You say, what is that? What style of service we're going to have? Now, every church has a different flavor. They do. I got that. I'll be honest with you. I like having traditional, the hymns we sang, I am I'm, uh, uh, redeemed, as well as having newer songs. But when the music overwhelms the message, there's a problem. Okay, the message is what is most important. Not that you can tap your, tap your toe to it. What is the message? But barring, once again, the extremes, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Every church is going to be a little bit different. It doesn't make them worse or better. It just means they're a little bit different. Now, my dad, I love my dad. My dad's one of my heroes. Half yeah, Father's Day, Dad, I'll call you later on. But my dad, he grew up, old school country 
Now, I call it picking and a grinning. Huh? The old 1940s Grand Ole Opry stuff. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I knew I'd have some fans out there with that. It drives me crazy. Huh? I, I, it's not my cup of tea. It's not what I enjoy. My children's choice of music is different than mine. They look at me and go, Dad, come on. Everybody's going to have a little bit different thing. It doesn't make it bad or make it worse. But I do think as long as, once again, we're in the framework of properly doing things, not against the Word of God, we need to be careful that we don't let that dominate our choice of where we're going to church or how much we're participating in it or whether we enjoy it. Say, so what are some things that people argue about? Well, they argue about music. They'll argue with how long the service is. Can I tell you this? If you look at your watch, I add five minutes. I just had 15 minutes just added on right there. I saw three of you go. Huh? <laughs> service length, the attire, the volume. Can I just share something with you? Somebody eventually has to draw the line on things. And we draw a pretty clear line as far as at our church of who and what we are. What you see today is pretty much what you're going to get every Sunday. Okay, we're not changing with the new programs and everything else that's going on. This is where we want to be. This is our lane. And I take a very close look at that. Uh, that's why, as far as musically wise, basically we approve everything. We make sure it's doctrinally straight, all these kind of things before we present it. Another thing that people argue about, prolonged minutia meetings. And they get inwardly focused. They're focused on how many business meetings you have. Did you follow Robert's rules of order? Do we have the Constitution? Do we have? They begin focused on these minutia things instead of the bigger picture. Facility focus. Dying churches are always concerned who gets the building. Always are. Look at the size of the building. Look at what we've got. You know what? We're looking for a building right now. You see one, let me, especially if it's free, let me know. But you know what? Our God is going to supply that need. Amen? Our God is going to supply that in his time. We don't need to be so focused on that. You know, this is not the church. You are the church. The church is not an organization. It's an organism. It's a living, breathing thing. And so we need to remember to focus on what truly is a church. You know, we could have church even if we didn't have a building. In fact, we may have come close a couple times during the pandemic. Uh, meeting out there. I love that. I'll be honest with you. That was kind of fun. Preaching from the back of the, the trailer or the truck. Felt like I was back in Nicaragua. Facility focused. Program driven. An inwardly focused budget. Inordinate demands for pastoral care. I'm going to pause on this one for a second. I tell you those that join the church, I say one of the very first, first things I tell them when they join at some point, I'm going to fail you. How many of you have heard me say this a little bit? Yeah. So I tell people, I'm going to fail you. This church is going to fail you. Keep your eyes on Jesus, not on me. But, you know, there's some things that pastors, we get in our mind that pastors are supposed to do, whether it's me or Pastor T or any other pastor. We have an idea of what they're supposed to do that's not written in Scripture. It's just something that pastors have done for a long time. If I don't see you in a while, a couple weeks, I'll probably give you a text or give you a phone call. But you know what? Can I share something with you? That shouldn't be why you're coming to church. You shouldn't come to church because the pastor's going to text you if you don't show up. Or that somehow, basically, I've got to make sure that, 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 you know, the pastor, he didn't call me after two weeks and I was gone. Wait a minute. I shouldn't be your sufficiency. I shouldn't be the reason that you serve the Lord. Huh? Who should be our sufficiency? Jesus Christ. It's that relationship here. So if you're not here for two or three weeks, you know who's more disappointed than your pastor? I've had people, I see them, they haven't come in a few weeks, and I see them when, in Walmart. They start ducking behind clothes. <laughs> huh? They kind of look down real quick, kind of walk around. And say, what do you do? I walk right up. Hey, how you doing? How you been? You know the first thing they tell me? They don't say, hey, pastor, how you been? No, they don't say, Pastor, I'm sorry, we, we, we really should have been there, but we had, and I'm like, you don't have to explain. It's okay. You see, ultimately, Cross Point Baptist Church, I want your relationship to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, not with me. I could die tomorrow. Okay. 
She said, no, not tomorrow. Life insurance isn't paid up yet, so not tomorrow. I could die tomorrow. You know what? Cross Point Baptist Church ought to continue on. You say, why? Because if we're focused on the right things, that part never changes. Attitudes of entitlement. Hmm? I give to the church so I have a right to have a say-so. That is a sorry reason. <laughs> to be honest with you, that's a sorry reason. Well, I give to the church. So it entitles me to. Oh, so people that give more, they're more entitled? People that aren't able to give because they're on a limited income, they don't have any voice at all? No, that's, that's, that's not what membership's about. Greater concern about change than about the gospel. Can I ask you something? What is the real purpose of church? The real purpose of church, as I see scripturally, is to edify the saints, to build up the saints, to be a witness to the lost. If I could just put it in one sentence, that's it. To build up the saints, our families, our marriages, and everything, that we be a light to the wa- those that are lost around the world. That's our, that's our role. That's our goal. But I've seen people get more concerned about the change that's taken place. Well, now they're doing three songs instead of four. <gasps> Clutch your pearls. Oh, my. Huh? <laughs> As compared that they go to a church that's not seen a soul saved in two years. But they're concerned about that change. Yet their baptistry is a, is a storage area. We've got to be careful, folks. If we're not careful, it happens so quickly that things begin to change. Anger and hostility. Anger and hostility. It can be at the pastor. It can be at the deacons. It can be at the leadership. It can be at somebody else in their church. And all of a sudden, that anger and hostility is focused inwardly instead of outwardly. Whenever you see a church that's having problems and they're fighting with each other, it always breaks my heart because what that means, that means they're expending all their energy inside the church instead of outside the church. And their testimony is no longer effective outside because the world sees they're fighting inside. And they're just like every other church that they can think of. So yeah, people just they talk like Christians, but then they start arguing and fighting. Number one thing here on the survey was evangelistic apathy. Cross Point Baptist Church is going to be about just that, pointing people to the cross. That's what's important. Not how we do the service, how long it is, how ugly the pastor is, <laughs> how much we like different colored chairs. Those things don't matter. This is what matters. Cross Point Baptist Church, just about every service that we have here on a Sunday, there's a call to salvation. Evangelism is what we're about, folks. But when a church begins to focus on themselves, when all of a sudden the membership starts saying, well, I, I don't like, 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 they're no longer, you don't see those people out winning the lost. You don't. Because they're, it's all about them and what they want. I'll just throw this out there for you as well. Some people wouldn't dream of going to a church that's not evangelistic, but yet they themselves have never led a soul to Christ. That's sad. That was free today. I wasn't going to talk about that, but number three, and I'll finish. The mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. What was Jesus' mindset? We should have the attitude that embodied Jesus Christ. The attitude we should embody should be that of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let's read this together here. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself. That's the same thing that Paul did, right? Remember how Paul said he made himself servant unto all? Jesus says, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a what? There's that word, servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and hath given him a name which is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This was Jesus' mindset. So what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do in this? What was his mindset? He didn't consider himself equality with God to be something to be used for his own advantage. This, this passage tells us that he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave. Number three, he humbled himself. You know, humility is going to be required if we're going to serve people. Humility is required if we are going to serve people. And number four, he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. How much of a servant are we? Are we truly dead to self when we enter into the church? Can I ask you just one last question? I, I do keep my word here. I'm going to close the service. Do I serve others or do others serve me? We ought to be serving others. But once again, that rhetorical question, ask yourself today. Are you serving others or are others serving you? If others have to serve you, if you're not giving back, if you're not working in the church, you don't have anything that you're participating in to try to reach the lost or try to make your church better to edify the body, you are going to be empty. Service is required of a Christian. It's not optional. There's a place in Palestine called the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, I don't know if you know this, it's almost impossible to drown in the Dead Sea. You know that? It's got so much alkali and chemical in it that literally it, you can't, you'll float. That's great news for me. I can't float. I sink. Huh? In fact, when I swim, they, people can't tell whether I'm having fun or they need to throw me a life preserver. I, th <laughs> I thrash a little bit. I can get there. It just takes me a little bit. So I like the idea of not being able to sink and, and, and floating. But do you know why that is? You see, the Sea of Galilee is in the north part of Israel, and the Jordan River flows down to the Dead Sea. When it gets to the Dead Sea, there's no outlet for the Dead Sea. All the water comes in and evaporates over time and leaves the sediment and the chemicals there. So literally, it's like called the Salt Sea or a chemical sea. Hence the word Dead Sea. No fish in there. That kind of life, it doesn't exist in the Dead Sea. Can I challenge you something about something Christian today? Don't be a Dead Sea Christian. Don't be a Dead Sea Christian. Hey, I go to Cross Point Baptist Church. We preach the Word of God here, right? I challenge you every week to make sure that we're living according to what Jesus Christ expects of us. You're getting the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. You're serving in a church that's evangelistic, that's going to go out this Saturday, God willing. We're going to go out this Saturday and invite people to come to church, tell them about the Lord. We ought to be doing these things. It flows down through the Jordan River of your life and gets into your life, and now it's in the Dead Sea. If you have no outlet, if you're not serving others, you're dead as a Christian. See, we have to have ways to serve others, not just having people serve us. Let me encourage you. Find somewhere to serve. Well, I don't want to work in the nursery. I'm with you there. <laughs> Changing my kids was never a fun thing for me. But you know what, ladies? We always have a need for people to serve in that capacity, if you can. Fellas, we need ushers. We need people to help out in different areas of the, of the church. Well, nobody's asked me. Why do they have to ask you? Come up and volunteer. Huh? We've got needs. Once again, what does that do? It helps you to see I'm being a part. I'm being a help. I'm being an encouragement. Find a way to serve. Because if not, once again, your Christianity is going to be dormant. And you'll never truly have the joy of the Lord. Because there's no outlet for everything that you're getting. And that's sad. On the way out, you'll see a table that's out there. 
we had did this a number of years ago, but we were doing it actually going into uh, the pandemic, and so it kind of everything went on hold. But we're starting it up again called Operation Outreach. As you walk out on the left-hand side here, just as you go out the door, there's a table there that has some cards, and they have rubber bands around them. Now, what that is is there are seven cards in each one of those rubber band stacks. I'm going to challenge you to give out one invitation to church every day. Just one. One a day. To grab one of those when you go out on Sunday, grab one of those things. Say, I'm going to be a part of Operation Outreach. I'm going to care about somebody else's soul instead of my own. I'm going to put someone else's salvation ahead of mine. And I'm going to say, I want to help them to find a place that's going to care for them and love them, and hopefully they'll have a fun time while they're there. That's something all of us could do, but can I even say this? Something all of us should do. Why did Jesus Christ come and become a servant? Why did he humble himself? Why did he even go to the death on the cross so he could bring salvation to every individual? I thank God that we serve a Jesus Christ, a Savior who loves all. No matter their skin color, huh? no matter their social status, he loves you and he died for you. And that's a message that's worth carrying to this world that's sorely lacking in love and compassion today. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your goodness to us. May you watch over us and help us, dear Lord to be everything that we should be. Lord, may we challenge ourselves to say, I'm not going to make my church or my choice of church about my preferences, but I'm going to keep it about that which is divine and that which is eternal. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the people that you brought here. Lord, may each of us challenge ourselves, Lord, to be the kind of witness as well as the kind of servant to others and those around us. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, can I ask you this? How many this morning would say, Pastor Crawford, I know, beyond a doubt, I know that I'm a Christian. I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Would you slip your hand up and let me see that? I know that I'm a Christian. You may put your hands down. Can I ask you this? Were you sitting there and say, Pastor, I don't really know that. I'm not certain that I'm a Christian. I don't know if I were to die right now. I'm not certain that heaven would be my home. Would you let me pray for you? I'm not drawing attention to you, I promise you. Between me, you, and the Lord. But would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not certain that I'm a Christian. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up and let me pray for you? I don't know that I'm saved. Pray for me. Let me ask you, Christian, are you a servant? Are you letting your preferences get in the way of your service? Are you letting personality issues that are not related to doctrine or direction, are they clouding your judgment? Well, right now where you're seated, why don't you just take the time to pray and say, Lord, help me to not be that divisive person. Help me not to be the squeaky wheel all the time. Help me to be encouraging to my church to be a blessing and to learn to serve. for a second. We're going to say our pledge. I didn't want you to think we were getting by without doing that. Uh, but this is our pledge for this week. Each week as we go through these lessons, we're having pledges. And basically, I'm asking you to say these with me. And let's just make this commitment as a church. I'm going to read it through once. That way you can decide whether or not you can complete this pledge. It says, I am a church member. I will not let my church be about my preferences and desires. That is self-serving. I'm a member in this church to serve others and to serve Christ. My Savior went to the cross for me. I can deal with any inconveniences and matters that aren't my preference or style. 
Let's go ahead and say this together. Hopefully you can say this with me. Ch uh, chapter 3 pledge. I am a church member. I will not let my church be about my preferences and desires. That is self-serving. I am a member in this church to serve others and to serve Christ. My Savior went to the cross for me. I can deal with any inconveniences and matters that aren't my preference or style. I hope that we can say that once again from our heart and make it the next time you have a problem, next time you have an issue over something. If it's not doctrinal, it's not foundational, it's not directional, get over it. Take a deep breath and say, you know what? In a church this size, we're going to have people with a lot of different ideas. We just need to accept those things. Ushers, have you come forward? I think the kids are ready to come in. We'll go ahead and have the kids come in. And as we prepare to take the offering, I encourage you once again to give. I don't look at tithing statements here. I have no idea what people give. I don't care what you give. That's between you and the Lord. But I would challenge you to make sure that the Lord Jesus Christ has control of your finances. If he has a control of your, your pocketbook, it's because he has control of your heart first. Okay, so let him control you first, and then, once again, it's easier to give. Brother Steve, would you turn, please, and lead us in the word of prayer? Amen. We're going to run through some announcements as they're taking the offering. Uh, Pastor T, if you could make your way up here, and also Brother Rich, I would like you to come up. We're going to make just a quick announcement uh, for what's going on here. Uh, so perhaps Pastor T, if brother, you and Brother Rich make your way up. Uh, looking here, this coming uh, Saturday, we will be doing door knocking. Uh, yesterday, we had it all planned, ready to go, and uh, it poured. It was just raining. So uh, being what we're looking to do when talking to people at the door, most people don't want to open the door when it's pouring. Uh, but Lord willing, we'll have that this coming Saturday, uh, the weather permitting. And then, Brother Rich, why don't you come up and tell us a little bit about awards night, if you could, please. And then also, I'd like you to make just a quick uh, announcement about what you what we're doing this summer and where they'd be needed, where they could be of use. All right. Uh, next Sunday is our awards uh, ceremony. Our last night at club is this coming Wednesday night. And we're going to have a time for the kids to get uh, certificates for participating, what they did with us. Uh, we got four of our kids selected that will come up and give you a verse that they learned and what it means to them, what, they, what uh, club has meant to them this year, uh, and basically just uh, congratulate the kids on a good year of club. We had a wonderful Amen. Uh, club, uh, year of club, and I'll tell you more about that next week. During the summer, starting the 14th of July, every three weeks we're going to go up to, we want to go up to Lamar Park and minister to the kids up there. We'd like to have all our Awana kids go up. The intent is to just have a bunch of noise, the kids having a bunch of fun. Uh, fun. Uh, we will be saturating the area so people will know that we are coming, but hopefully when we get there and the kids with their excitement will help draw the kids in so that we can try and minister to them. That's our intent. I'm looking for people that, will, that can come with us. Uh, I've got a couple of people I'm not asking for everybody to commit for each one of those Wednesday nights. We'd like to have three groups, but if you're interested, by all means, uh, be glad to have you to come with us. We'll be doing games, song time, and teaching them, uh, giving them a little uh, uh, salvation presentation to try and bring them into uh, God's saving grace. Amen. Hopefully, we'll bring the kids into our club next Amen. fall. That is not that is a secondary purpose. Amen. We do want that, but we'd like to just have our kids have a chance to minister to other kids in the neighborhood. Amen. Thank you, brother. Pass it to Brother T. Um, also, the next Sunday after the Iwana program, I encourage you to come and be a part of that. It's going to be exciting to see the kids doing things. Brother Rich is going to bring the message next Sunday. Uh, but it'll be, a, it'll be an important time for us to tell our kids, hey, we support you. Iwana's is important. It teaches them the word of God from a young age, and we want to encourage them uh, in that regard. After the Iwana program, there is going to be, I think, a luncheon and then a, a, a baby shower for uh, Luna McKinney. Um, and uh, Brother, uh, actually, uh, Adam and Tasha um, led them to Christ here in our church, baptized them, married them, and uh, this is their, their newest little one. 
is coming to church. So a wonderful family, and they will be here with us next week with this. So encourage the ladies, kind of make note of that. Stick around for that. Be an encouragement in the Canes during that time. Pastor Gene, why don't you talk about a couple of things with the teens? So one of the big things that is coming up here, if you look on, on the screens as well, is on the 28th, that starts our, uh, our teen camp. So I encourage all of our teens to make sure that you're setting uh, some money aside for that to be able to buy some things that are there, but to prepare to go and have a great time. I would encourage, once again, all of our parents of teens, encourage them to go and say, well, my teen doesn't want to go. Send them anyway. They'll have a great Amen. time. Trust me. Uh, I have a friend who that was the case. He never really wanted to go. He went with us the last year, his senior year of high school. Now he's a pastor. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just it, it, I can't stress how important camp is for our teens. It's great for them to unplug from everything for a little bit, get around good, uh, good other teens and, and have a blast playing games, but then also hear the word of God preach to them. Uh, and it's, it's a great time. I strongly, strongly encourage uh, all of our teens, parents of teens, make sure you're planning on going. Um, I did want to mention, too, uh, if you are interested in maybe sponsoring a team, maybe maybe you're you're well, we won't say elderly. We'll just say up there. We'll just say up there. <laughs> and you know, and, and you know, you don't have any teens in your house, but you want to help maybe a teenager who maybe that maybe funds aren't there for them to be able to go. I'd encourage you to be giving to that as well right now. Uh, to sponsor a, a teen, it's it's a great great thing uh, for our church to rally around. Again, our teenagers. They are the future. Amen. As scary as that can be sometimes. Yes. They are the future. And so we want to invest in that. So this is a great way for us as a church family to invest in our teens. All we'd ask is that if you go ahead and take either the envelope or, or if you're or writing a check, to just go ahead and put on their teen camp. Okay, so that way we know what it's going to. Uh, so I really, really want to encourage our teens about that. Then also, this is kind of for our, 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 our teens and for our, our kids. The teens are going to be more uh, helping in this area. But we're going to be looking to have our vacation Bible school. Last yeah. year, we weren't able to because of, uh, of, of the pandemic and everything that was going on there. But this year, uh, the last week of July, the 26th, 27th, and 28th, we're planning on doing our vacation Bible school. And our vacation Bible schools aren't, aren't if you were, how many of you were here for the first one that we did here? Okay. They're not normal in the sense of like, <laughs> you know, a craft. It's more like a giant kids rally all day. Well, not all day, but for a couple hours. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, we do a lot of games with them. Uh, but then also, again, this is a way for us to reach out into our community to get kids who maybe wouldn't come to church another time and possibly their parents. It always amazes me how many parents will stick around and watch the whole thing, but then also hear the messages that are, pre that are presented. Uh, it's a great way of outreach for us. Uh, and so I really, really encourage our, our church family to be praying about that, uh, that the Lord would work greatly, and we'd see a lot of kids come. Uh, and again, maybe help as a way, too, of growing that, that fall uh, Awana program as it gets around the corner, too. So those are the couple of big announcements we have. So that's teen camp coming up here at the end of June, and then the last week of July we'll be having our vacation Bible yeah, school. Great. Thank you, Steve. Have the worship team come on up at this time. I'd like to see all of our teens go to teen camp. All of our teens go to teen camp. Uh, it's just so important. Uh, many decisions over the years have been made from going to teen camp, and uh, we promise that they will have a good time once again being there. Um, but I really encourage us to do that. Make sure if you have a teenager, you plan to just send them. And Fresh was kind of joking, tongue-in-cheek, but if they don't want to go, uh, send them anyway. We'll take care of that. I talked to one parent one time. They said, our kids don't want to come to church or church activities. I said, then it won't hurt to make them come. I mean, if they don't want to come anyway, they're not going to get right with God at home in front of the television. Uh, so bring them. Faith comes by. And, well, I'm stop. We can preach. I got more time. <laughs> faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you want to change your kid's heart, they're like, so they're so hard to church things. Their heart is so hard to the things of God. Then send them to camp. Mm -hmm. Send them to the youth activities. Bring them on Wednesday nights. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The less you have them under the word of God, the less likely is their faith is going to grow. I can stop. I'm telling you, you're looking like stunned. It's not a rocket science here, okay? So I encourage you, send your, your kids to camp, but also the kids to Vacation Bible School. That's an important time. You're going to enjoy Vacation Bible School this year. Uh, we're going to do some skits and do some different things. You're going to see your pastors in a different role. So <laughs> I promise you that. But we're just so mature and proper here. You'll, it's completely different during Vacation Bible School. All the gloves are off. So looking forward to that. Okay, let's stand. We'll sing, I'll live for Jesus day after day. Real quick, we'll sing real quick, this together. Before, before we do that, I did forget to mention, with teen camp, there are waivers. I saw Josh in the background kind of waving at me there for a second. There are waivers that have to be signed for teen camp. So if you're planning on sending your teens uh, to teen camp, please see Josh. Josh, you want to kind of wave your hand in the back there. He has those. He's collecting those for me. 
Uh, so again, if you are attending with the teen camp, make sure you stop by and see him. I'll live for Jesus.